hallelujah to the Lamb. He is our God. He is our risen Savior. And we worship Him, Him alone. We come to this hallowed ground to lift up Jesus the Christ, the righteous Son of God who has paid the price for us a price we couldn't pay. He's paid the price for us because he alone, he is worthy alone. There's nobody like him. There's none like him. printout says, your, your PowerPoint says Hebrews 9. We should be in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 and 15. Trust me this time. Trust me. Trust me this time. You may not be able to trust me that time, but trust me this time. Hebrews chapter 4. If you would stand, if you can stand, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 is the whole pericope. You found it, you will discover these words, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Hebrews chapter 4 in the New Testament, verses 14 through 16. You've discovered it. You will find these words. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at every point, or all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might or may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I want to talk about the goat, Jesus, the goat, the greatest of all times. He is the goat. G period, O period, a period, T period, Jesus, the greatest of all times. Amen. You see, every generation has a group of people they can look up to. And many of us have labeled our heroes as the goats. We've labored them the greatest of all times. In my generation, we said that Arthur Ashe was the greatest of all times. In your generation, you say Serena Williams is the greatest of all times. In my generation, we said Michael Jordan was the greatest of all times. In your generation, you say the crybaby LeBron James, the greatest actor, is the greatest of all times. In my generation, we said that Clashes Clay was the greatest of all times. In your generation, you say Muhammad Ali was the greatest of all times. 
You may even say that Michael Spinks was the greatest of all times. Some may say that Mike Tyson was the greatest of all times. Many may say that Jack Nichols was the greatest of all times. Now we say Tiger Woods is the greatest of all time. In my generation, we had concluded that James Rodney Richard was the greatest of all times. Now they have the audacity to say that Nolan Ryan is the greatest of all times. You see, every generation has heroes, and we have come to the conclusion that those heroes are the greatest of all times. Today, they say Shikari Richardson is the fastest woman in the world. But in my day, Flo Joe, Florence Griffin Jerner, was the fastest woman to ever live. Every now and then, somebody is able to come by and do some things that no one else will do. Even in the acting world, people would say that they have heroes. Some have concluded that LL Cool J is the greatest of all times. But I stopped by with my little speech today to remind us that there's only one who is the greatest of all times. His name is Jesus. He is certainly the greatest of all time because Every person that I have named has a match. Somebody who has come along and tried what he or she has done and possibly done just as well. But when it comes to Jesus, there is no match for him. There's no component or no opponent who can stand up to him. He is truly the greatest of all time. If you're going to have a goat, I submit to you today to try Jesus, for he is the greatest of all time. When it comes to fatherhood, there are men who are doing excellent jobs. When it comes to motherhood, there are women who are, who are doing things that other mothers are not doing for their children. But every woman and every man has an opponent or a component or a competition that adds up to or uh, maybe even better than he or she is. But just my little short message this morning, I want to say to you that Jesus the Christ, he has no competition. There is no component that matches up to him. There's no opponent that matches up to him. His name is Jesus. He's the righteous son of God. And when we needed somebody to pull us out, we had to call on Jesus because there is nobody like him. When we look at the text, the text declares that that Joshua was involved. And you know when there's a Moses, there ought to be a Joshua. And one of these days, Pastor Davis is going to leave here. I don't know when and I don't know where. Some other young man will stand where I stand and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ like I have never done before. And it's all right, members. Because Jesus is the greatest, not Pastor Davis is the greatest. 
We have to understand that there are some great men and women who have come along before us and we stand on their shoulders and they are the ones who opened doors for us and made ways for us and we ought to give them credit for what they have done but they are not the greatest of all time. Jesus the Christ himself is the greatest of all times. His name is is Jesus. In the text, in the text, it talks about the fact that there were some, there were some, there were some, there were some goats and some sheep. And there were some people who who lived lived their lives, and they killed the goats, they killed the sheep, and they did it for the sake of other folk, the preacher, the priest, the great high priest would go in behind the veil of the temple once a year and the priest would plead the case of the people and, and he would talk to God on the people behalf and he would talk to the people on God's behalf. He would go into the holy of holies, but when he wasn't right, he died in the face of God. He was the high priest. He was, the, he was the, the chief priest. He was the priest that was like none other. But let me tell you, even when men got some things going well for them, they are not the greatest of all time. Jesus is the greatest of all time because when they sent the priest in before God behind the veil, he would walk in and he had a rope tied around his waist. He had bells on the skirt of his garment and the bells were ringing to let the people People know that the preacher was still living when he went in behind the Holy of Holies. And when he went in, the people were loving, the people were liking, the people were enjoying the fact that the bells were ringing. Let me tell you, sometimes bells would ring and we get happy about the bells ringing. But sooner or later, the bells will stop ringing in our lives. The priest, the priest, as long as the bells were ringing. As long as the bells were chiming, as long as the bells were ringing, when he went in behind the Holy of Holies, the bells would ring it because he was moving. And at the skirt of his garment, every bell would sound as he moved. The people were happy about that because this man, the holy man, this man, the high priest, was pleading their case before an awesome, amazing God. And let me tell you, if you think you are not in sin, if you think you have not fallen in sin, just hold your hope. Just wait just a minute. Let me declare unto you that we all have sinned. We all have fallen short. We all have messed up. We all have fallen short of God's glory. And we need somebody to plead our case on our behalf. Romans 3 and 23 said we all have sinned. It didn't say we y'all have sinned. It said we all have sinned. And we all have fallen short. We all are messed up. And because we all are messed up, we can't look down our nose at anybody else because we just got sin that's different from their sin. I used to, used to look up to men. I, I would look at men, and to, and to this day, I would still look at men, and I would be amazed at what they can do and what they can say and how they can put words together. I sat under Pastor Manson Johnson for, for 15 years, and I watched the man, and I looked at his life, and I saw what he could do. He could stand, and he could proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. People will be, be flooding the pews and getting down, coming down the, the aisleway just so they can hear this man. It it was amazing to me. I had concluded that he was the greatest of all time, but the fact of the matter is one day he had to have his hands fold in service for the very last time. His tongue cleaved to the roof of his mouth for the very last time. He had to give up the ghost. And let me tell you, when we put men on pedestals, we need to understand they are not the greatest of all time, but Jesus is the greatest of all time. He is, he is the greatest of all times. We need to understand that our lives can be cut short in a hurry. Don't put your confidence in any woman. Don't put your confidence in any man. Don't put your faith in anybody because sooner or later they gonna let you down. When we look at the text, the Bible talks about how the high priest would go in and, and he would plead the case of the people. 
and he meant well. And he made sure that he did things well. But when he went behind the veil of a temple, and he got in there and his life wasn't right before God, his bells would stop ringing. My question to you today, are your bells still ringing? My question to you today, are you still moving on behalf of God? My question to you today, is God still moving in your life? Because if God's not moving in your life, then sooner or later, God is going to deem you unworthy before him. As long as the bells were ringing, as long as situations was going well, the people were rejoicing. The priest would go in and he would plead their cases and the people were excited about it. But the fact of the matter is, when his life was off course, when he wasn't at one with God, when he wasn't walking with God, he would die behind the veil. They would drag him out by that rope that was tied around his waist. They would pull him out. And as they pulled him out, they sent another brother in. And let me tell you, if you were one of the priests during that time, you wanted to make sure that your life was straight with God simply because if it wasn't straight with God, it didn't matter how many men they would sit in, they would continue to pull and drag them right out over and over and over again. But the greatest of all time has come. His name is Jesus. His life is right. His life is tight. His life is one that has set forth a standard. When we look at the text in, in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, we have a compassionate Christ. We have a compassionate God. We, we have a God who is able to see things and do things we have never done. We have a God who is able to make life better for us. We have a God that he can feel and, and see what we feel and, and act upon what we feel. It says that seeing then that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. You see, he writes the this text, he writes it at a time where, where people's lives are wavering. He writes it at a time where people's faith are wavering. I think he wrote it at a time because he saw this time, because we're in the midst of the same kind of time when lives are wavering, where people are not sure about the God they serve. People are not even sure about how they made here. They don't, they're not even sure about when they get here, who they are. And we have grown folks still trying to figure out who you are. Let me tell you, God made you who you are. Just like he made you, he wants you to be who you are. The text, the text declares that he is compassionate. He, we have a great high priest that has passed through heaven. Jesus the Christ was sitting in heaven. Jesus the Christ existed in heaven. He existed before he got off in Bethlehem of Judea. He was already there. No one made Jesus. God just used Mary to get him here. And so watch it, watch it, watch it. When you say, when somebody asks you how you're doing, be careful that you don't respond, I am blessed and highly favored. Because the Bible says that Mary was one that was blessed and highly favored. And it wasn't about Mary. It was the fact that Mary was chosen by the awesome God to be blessed and highly favored. Because God chose her to bring the Savior of the world to the land. But remember, she's only conduit. We can't worship Mary. We can't put our stock into Mary. We, we can't be saved by Mary. We cannot give gl glory to Mary. She was just the conduit. She was just an instrument. She, she was just the tool that God used to get Jesus here. And he was going to use somebody. He chose a virgin named Mary. 
But we have to worship her son. We have to bow down to him. I told you before, if the president was to walk in this room, music would start playing before it comes in. And if he was to walk in the room, people would stand in honor of a great man. But when Jesus shows up, we can no longer stand in his sight. We have to bow down to him because he's the greatest of all times. The text says, the text says we, we have such a great high priest. This is the one who pleads our case on our behalf. Jesus pleads our case. Let me tell you, the Bible says the Holy Spirit pleads our case with groaning and moanings that we do not know of because we don't really know how to pray. Even though in John chapter 17, Jesus says this is how we see Jesus praying and we ought to pray like he praying. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus sets this model of how we ought to pray. But when it comes to getting in touch with God, us in the physical, we cannot get in touch with him. So the Holy Spirit, he and interprets what we have to say with every moaning and every groaning that we cannot explain on our own. At, at, at the house, at the house, sometimes you would hear mama, grandmama, granddaddy, big daddy, somebody mourning, and then you would know that they're not moaning because they're hurting. They, they, are, they are talking, you're talking about a prayer language. They, they're talking to the almighty God. Every now and then, they will break out in a hymn and start mourning that hymn. They, they wouldn't speak the words. They would just moan that hymn all day long. And, and when you walked in the house, they didn't have a radio playing. They didn't have a TV playing. They were making their own music. The text, the text declares that Jesus is a high priest, and we ought to make melody in our heart in honor to him and him alone. First thing I see, I see a compassionate God. I see a compassionate God. He's a compassionate God simply because he has left heaven to deal with us. Jesus has left heaven. The Jesus that I'm talking about, the God that we serve, he left a heavenly throne to come here and mess with me. He, he left heaven to, to mess with my mess. And let me tell you, if you're wondering what you're called to do, your mess will become your ministry. I said, I said, your mess can become your ministry. You need to make sure that whatever experience God has taken you through, you realize that you can minister to other people that way. And you don't have to be a preacher to minister. You can minister to other people because God didn't allow you to go through all that stuff just so you can live and go to heaven anyhow. God has anointed us to minister to somebody else. We can choose whether we want to be a minister and help somebody or we can sit on our hands and enjoy the ride. Let me tell you, if you just sit on your hand, enjoy the ride, then you won't enjoy the ride. Many times I, I ride the pine. How many of you know what riding the pine is? I, I had to ride the pine sometime. I, I had to ride the pine. Sometime I just sit on the bench. Sometime I, I, I got ready to go home. I hadn't gone to outfield yet. Sometime I never showed up in short stuff. I had to ride the pine sometime. But let me tell you, after the championship was over, I won the trophy. I won, I won the, the excitement, but the excitement was missing because I was riding the pine. So what I would do, I would do, Brother Turner, I'd take me a running start from third base all the way down to home plate, and I would slide into home so I wouldn't go home all clean. Let me me tell you, unless you participate in the activity, then you don't experience the joy and the thrill of being there. You have athletes, you have, you have athletes that they win championships after championship, and they never get off the bench. And they can go around and flash the rings, and they have the trophies, but there's an emptiness inside of them. And they're saying every time that championship conversation comes up, they are saying, I was there, but I might as well have been a spectator because I wasn't a participator. God doesn't have any spectators. God only has participators. You need to find out where God is calling you to participate and get right in there because the Bible says that Jesus participated for us. He participated for us. He participated for us in such a way that he gave his only, only life that he could have had. God participated because God gave us the greatest sacrifice in his son Jesus. Seeing we have a high priest that, that can handle our emotions. We have a high priest that can handle our 
our, empathy, our problem. He sympathized. The Bible says he sympathized with us. He sympathized. He sympathized. And the fact of the matter is, he passed through heaven. He, he left heaven. The Bible says Jesus, the Son of God, is the greatest of all time. He says, let us hold on to this confession. Let us hold on to our confession that there is none like him. There is nobody like our Lord. There is nobody like Jesus. There is nobody like the Lord we serve. There is none who compares to him. There is no one who rivals him. There is nobody like Jesus because Jesus stands in a place all by himself. He it says, it says it's Jesus, the son of God. John says in his writing, John 3.16, he says that he's not only the son of God, he's God's only begotten son. He is God's only unique son. He is God's one-of-a-kind son. He passed from heaven and, and came to earth for us. He did it. He did it for us. He did it for us. And because he did it for us, we ought to do some things for him. He says, let us hold fast to our confession. Let us hold fast. Don't let anybody turn you around. The, the hymn knowledge just says it like this. And nobody can turn me around now. Nobody can change my heart now. Nobody can change my mind now. Nobody can do something that's different and teach me something that's different is in my heart now. Bible, the, the, the story is told. The story is told by a young boy that went to vacation Bible school. He went to a summer enrichment camp. He went to the church for a whole week. And the dad and mama didn't believe in God. But this boy kept showing up at the church for five days. And then when, they showed, when he showed up at church, they were singing Bible stories. They were talking Bible talk. They were reading Bible verses. And, and they gave them a little New Testament Bible like we used to do in the old church. They gave him a little, little New Testament Bible, and every night that boy would go home and he would read that Bible. Then he would come back with excitement in the morning, and, and he would go five days with this same enthusiasm, this excitement, because he had found something that no one had told him about. He had come in touch with Jesus. He came home the first day, and Dad said, I don't want you quoting those scriptures around this house. So he had to hold his peace. Came back home the second day. He said, I don't want you handling that Bible around this house. So the boy found a way in the corner to read his Bible. The third day he came home, he, he said, I don't want you reading that Bible in my house. So the boy had to have respect for his dad and put the Bible down. But one night, the dad had found the boy. He had the cover over top of him had a flashlight under the cover in the bed. The daddy walked by and he saw a light shining in the little boy's room. He opened the door, he pulled back the cover, and the boy had a flashlight holding the flashlight as he read the Bible. The daddy said, I don't want that Bible here around here. I told you, I don't want it here. Don't bring it around here. So he took the boy's Bible. He threw it in the trash. The next day the boy had gotten it out the trash and began to read the Bible again. The daddy caught him with the Bible again. By now it's day five. The boy brought the Bible in the house and the daddy was waiting on him. He took his Bible from him. I told you not to get this Bible again. I told you not to bring it in this house. And then he took the Bible, he ripped it to threads, and he put it in a barrel and he started burning the boy's Bible. Finally, the boy st stood up and he said, Daddy, you can burn my Bible now. But I ain't worried about it anymore. It's in my heart now. And since it's in my heart, there's nothing you can do about it. Let me tell you, we ought to put stuff in children's heart. And when we put it in their heart, then nobody can take it out. They can go off to college and not lose it. They can get married and not lose it. They can live among heathens and not lose it. It's in your heart. The Bible declares that we ought to hold on to our confession of faith. Our faith and in Jesus Christ. So I see the compassion. This God that, 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 that we have, he, there is nothing that we can go through that he has not gone through. In verse number 15, it says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are 
tempted, yet without sin. Let me tell you, the God we have is not only, not only is he a God of compassion, he is a God of, of championship. He's not only a God of compassion, he's a God of championship. The text declares right here in our reading, it says that, that he has always done things that we are going through. There's no weakness you have. There's no emotion you have. There's no situation that you're caught in. But Jesus has already gone through it, and he is the champion of it. He has the championship trophy. He has been the one who has blessed us. Yeah, he, he's a compassionate God. He's a God of championship. He's the one that keeps us in the midst of all that we're going through. He's the one who blesses us. He's the one that holds us. He's the one that keeps us in the midnight hour when we don't know what to do. We don't know how to do it. And we don't know who to turn to. We got to turn to the champion among all champions. He is the goat. He's the greatest one of all times. When you're weak, you better call on him. When you think you're strong, you better call on him. When you think you're losing, you better call on him. When you know you're winning, you better call on him. When you're looking as a spectator, you better call on him. When you're in midst of participating, you better call on him. Because he is the champion that has solved our problems. He paid the price a long time ago. Not only is he, is he, a, is he a compassionate God, not only is he the God of championship, He's a God of continuation. He is a compassionate God. He's a God of championship. And he's a God of continuation. Our God is consistent. The same thing that he tells us today, he told us yesterday. The text, the text declares in verse, in verse number 16, it says to us, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. God is able to not only give us compassion, God is able not only to grant us the championship, but the God I serve, he's also able to be consistent and he is constant. He's the only thing that is constant right now. When you look at our Congress, they can tell you, yeah, I'm going to vote you in. When you look at the Congress, they can tell you, yeah, I'm going to be on your side. When you look at Congress, they'll tell you, yeah, I'm here for you. When you look at Congress, they tell you, yeah, I'm going to be right there with you. But when it's time to plead your case, when it's time to do the things that they said they would do, they turn and walk away from you. Let me just share you the God we serve. He is a constant God. He is the goat and nobody will take his title and nobody will take his place. He is the God of all time and he will continue to be the God. The Bible says that he is is the one who will be consistent. He's the one who will be constant. He is the God for the past. He's God for the present. He's God for the future. He will never change because he is God. How you know preacher? Because over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary, he gave his only begotten son. Yeah, they, he gave his only son. His son is Jesus, the righteous lamb of God. Jesus the Christ. He is the champion. He is the compassionate one. He is the consistent one. His name is Jesus. He is the goat and there will nobody ever take his place. His name is Jesus on a skull hill called Calvary. He died I tell you. Mean men killed him. He died a horrible death. He died crucifixion on Calvary. He died until the earth wheeled and rocked like a drunken man. He died until mean men were satisfied. He died died until the devil rejoiced. They took him off the cross, laid him in a borrowed tomb. It was a borrowed tomb because he didn't need it too long. Early that third day morning, he got up with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. He died once for all and he doesn't have to die again. Jesus of Christ, he got up with all power. He took a seat on the right hand side of God. He's making intercessions for you and me. And one of these old days, in the morning, one of these old days, 
while we're going through. One of these old days, Jesus of Christ will crack the sky and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him. We're going to be caught up with him. We're going to be caught up with him. And the Bible says we will forever be with the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. One of these days in the morning, we don't know when. We don't know what time. We don't know if it's going to be daylight saving time or it's going to be regular time. We don't know if it's going to be central or mountain time. But one of these days, Jesus will crack the sky. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him. And we're going to forever be with the Lord. Let me just share with you. We're going to praise him like the four beastly creatures. We're going to praise him like the 24 elders. We're going to rejoice with him. Blessed is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being the goat. Thank you for being the greatest of all time. Thank you for being who you are. And you blessed us to be who we are. His name is Jesus. I'm on my way. <laughs> Are you on your way? <laughs> I'm on my way to the other side. I'm, I'm on my way to the other side. And when I get there, I want to see Jesus. The one who died for me. The one who laid down for me. The one who gave his life for me. The one who suffered for me. The one who gave a voluntary death for me. I thank God for Jesus. He made a way out of no way. And one of these days, I'm going to be with him. The question today is, will you be with him? Will you be with him? Will you rejoice? Or you be with the weeping and the gnashing of teeth? You see, hell was made for somebody. Our decision to make a difference is right now. When we're dead... Hebrews chapter 9 was my background text because that's what I was studying. Hebrews chapter 9 says it like this. When you're dead, after your death, there comes the judgment. You will be judged for everything you've done in this life. You will be judged for every thought, every idle word. You got to get it right with Jesus today. Because life is not promised to us. And as we live today, we can't afford to wait. We got to get it right today. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Right now. Right now. The door is open. Will you trust him? Will you confess him? Will you hold on to that confession? That Jesus is the son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. When they killed Jesus, after he was dead, they pierced him in his side. Out came blood and water. And this blood was for our salvation. If we can trust Jesus, we can be saved. Life can be made the better if we just trust him. If you have not trusted Jesus, I'm asking you to bow your head with me and invite him into your life. It's not hard, it's not difficult, it's not insanity. But what you have to do is repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me over 2,000 years ago. Will you bow your head and just repeat this simple prayer after me and invite him into your life? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. 
Now come into my life and make me a new person. I believe you to be the son of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, believing and trusting that Jesus is the son of God, that you're saved and now you qualify for heaven. And now we have to live this life as if we know Jesus. And there are many of us who know Jesus, but every now and then sin just ravages our lives. I want to pray for us. If you're struggling right now, you can stand where you are, you can approach the altar, or you can stay seated. But if you struggle like I do, you struggle with something. Or you struggle with somebody. Or you struggle with something. I want to ask God to bless us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I come. I come representing all of us who struggle. Lord, we struggle with life. We struggle with our faith. We struggle with our, our trust in you. We struggle with our church attendance. And Lord, we struggle with sin. Lord, your word says that Jesus has sympathized with us. And whatever we go through, he has already conquered it. Your word declares, Father God, that Jesus is the champion. Jesus is compassionate. Jesus is with us. Now, Lord, we pray as we confess our sins all over the airways, all over this room, that you forgive us. Lord, we've missed the mark. Lord, we've fallen short. Lord, we've not done the things that are pleasing in your sight. God, I ask you to forgive us. Lord, give us strength to turn away from our sins. Bless us to honor you as our great God. Lord, I ask you to bless us to be able to turn to you in the midst of temptation. Remind us, Father God, that we are a new creature. We are a new creation. We are new people. Bless us to be about your business, Lord. Bless us to win souls for Christ. Bless people to look at our lives and see the difference in our commitment. We thank you that Jesus was committed to us. He fully committed for us. Lord, I ask you to bless us. Lord, give us favor with God and with mankind. Bless us with mercy. Your word says that you give us mercy in times of need. Lord, we need mercy. Bless us with your grace, Father God. We need grace. Lord, you made us, and you know all about us. We ask you to bless us. And Lord, we thank you for doing a great work in us. And bless us to recommit ourselves. And we trust you, Lord. Lord, we love you. Lord, we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. When we thank God for who he is and what he has already done, we serve the awesome and the amazing God. God has tremendously blessed us.